When I first arrived in Hong Kong in 2014, I saw a woman speak at an event. Her story made me... Well, I don't find the words that give credit to how much her sharing impacted me and you will hear me trying to grasp for words a couple of times in this episode. I'm beyond grateful that seven years after I listened to her for the very first time, I bumped into her at an awards ceremony. She has received many awards for her work. And when I asked her if she would come on Hashtag Impact, she said yes. I am Regina Larco, and you're listening to Hashtag Impact, a podcast about stuff that matters. Before we start, I want to let you know that getting more voices heard is what drives us at Hashtag Impact. The voices of the incredible guests you hear on our channel, but also your voice. If you ever thought about starting your own podcast, but you wonder where to start, where you would even begin, then I want to help you. You can access the first chapter of my online podcasting course at hashtag impact.com slash free. For you, this chapter is free of charge and you will get all the guidance you need to take the first steps into getting your voice out there. You don't have to figure this out on your own and the world needs to hear your voice. And today you get to hear the beautiful voice of Shalini. Shalini Matani is a mom of three. She is a feminist and a champion for social injustice. Ethnically Indian, she is an ethnic minority of Hong Kong. An accountant by training, a banker subsequently, she founded an NGO called Community Business, working with companies on diversity and inclusion. She also founded the Zubin Foundation, a charity that improves the lives of Hong Kong ethnic minorities. The charity works in outreach and systemic changes and is named after her son Zubin, who died of medical negligence in 20. Oh my goodness, I cannot say it, see, in 2009. Oh, I just stumbled over this, Shalini. Uh, when I asked you what others should know about you beforehand, that's what I just read out to our audience. You said, the first thing you said is that you are a mom of three. And in an interview you gave a few years back, what I heard there was that often you notice that although this title you know the title of the mom that is featured on your cv it is the one that most most often is left out than when the people that interview introduce you uh, how how do you feel about that i think that um having children is an enormous privilege And it's also an enormous pain. And in my case, they go hand in hand. I, even before I had children, I always thought it was strange that women who are, who are successful and in positions of leadership, and I've advocated for women in leadership for a very long time, they, they thought they needed to suppress that part of them publicly. And in their CV, they they, all, they always name their great achievements with awards and positions. But that was a part that they hid. And when I became a researcher and researched women on boards and women in leadership, again, before I had children, I realized that these women never stopped thinking about their children. And for them, their children were central to everything they did. And there was also this constant guilt that they felt. But they never put that on their CV. And I, and I felt that was strange that society had pushed us to not recognize that role if we were leading organizations. And I just felt when I had children, um, 
I needed to put that forward because it is my biggest role and it is a role that doesn't go away. Um, it doesn't end at any time and it doesn't end hopefully for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, I just felt, I, I feel that the role of mother is the biggest role I have and it needs to be recognized as that. Mm. And um, I think too that mothers everywhere, I suppose they too need to see that other women are recognizing it in order for them to feel comfortable recognizing it. And so my hope is that more of us will feel comfortable enough to talk about our, our role as a mother. And it doesn't take away from the other things we do. It adds to it. We need to be comfortable to say it. Some of our most loyal listeners, they will recognize your voice because we've had your beautiful voice on the channel before. Uh, it is now, it has been almost two years. Can you believe it? It was a special uh, that our very talented Avani Laroyo put together uh, while I was still on maternity break, actually. So this is almost like a, a little bit of a following up on that conversation that I wish we would have already had back then. But I was just not in the office just yet. But I'm so grateful for that episode when we talked to three charities in Hong Kong to share how they were coping with the pandemic and how they had pivoted. And all these stories touched me greatly. I, I recommend everyone to also go back and listen to, to that episode we did. Um, what really struck me, um, there were many things that struck me, what you shared in that audio message. We just asked you to send in an audio message, right? <laughs> Uh, to us and you shared about your story and your work with the Subin Foundation and besides the things you said about how you had pivoted and how you all of a sudden started to hand out care packages what you never thought you would do but just these basic needs were now really not even met for the vulnerable groups you worked with so that was a thing that struck me but when it comes to your personal story um there you share that you were brought up in a conservative Hong Kong Indian family and you as a girl child, that's what you said, the biggest ambitions that your parents had for you were to get married yes. and you broke out of that. How? How? You know, um, yeah, so from a very young age, I was told that I would marry. And I was told that I wouldn't study um, past a certain grade. And in those days, that was known as Form 5, or for those of you who have kids in the UK, it's your, up to your GCSE levels. And if I was exceptional, I would do my A-levels, which is to get to um, the equivalent of the IB or the A-levels. And um, it was just clear. It was always told to me, too, that I kind of am not going to be in that family permanently that my end family will be the family into which I marry. So that this family was um, my family, that in our community, which is the Cindy community, there's also a word for that, your original family, and then your family you go into. And the assumption is that you merge with your husband's family and you become their family and you go from being a daughter of this family into a daughter in law of that family. And in an ideal situation, that family treats you just like a daughter. So they treat you with grace. They treat you with grace. How did I how did I break out of it? Well, I think that at the age of 13, I went to India for the first time. And um, actually a lot happened when I was 13. So I went to India for the first time. 
And I remember being completely blown away by the poverty in India. And I'm not sure if I've shared this with you before, Regina, but I arrived in Bombay. It was very late at night. I was with my parents. My dad has a sister, had a sister in Bombay. We arrived in her block of apartments and um, we arrived on, call it the third floor of her building. Um, we got out of the lift and the, the corridor between the lift and her front door was dark, pitch black. It was maybe two, three in the morning. And as we were walking from the lift to her front door, I was stepping on stuff and I didn't know what I was stepping on. It was pitch dark. And I remember saying to my parents, I'm really scared. I'm really scared. What am I stepping on? And, you know, so we we're walking with our suitcases and I'm stepping on stuff. And, and then, you know, when we finally got into my aunt's apartment, I was like, what was that? It's really, it was really freaky. And I was told it was the domestic help that they slept in the, they slept outside the homes. And I remember being so incensed and outraged that this could happen, that how dare we, particularly as I was brought up Hindu, as Hindus, treat others like this. And it really, really bothered me. And I remember saying to my mum, I cannot stay in my aunt's house. I cannot do this. We've got to tell her to stop it. And she said, look, this is not our place. We're visitors here. You're not going to rock the boat. And I remember being so upset about that. And then the next day, I remember going out with my parents. We were in India for my cousin's wedding. And we got into a beautiful, fine Indian clothes and, you know, wore some gold jewelry. And we went into this car and we got driven to this beautiful hotel. And on the way, there were girls who were my age, you know, 13. They had breasts and they were, you know, they were completely bare-breasted. And they were feeding young babies off their breasts, their babies. And it was such a stark contrast to my life in Hong Kong. And I remember um, when the car stopped at the traffic lights, you know, these women would come and knock on your window. And I wanted to put the window down and pay these women because they were begging. And my parents said, you can't do that. And I said, no, we can. We must. We have. And they said, no, they'll, they'll mold the car. And I was like, but that girl's my age. And just the discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots just really played on me. So at 13, that was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened at 13 was I um, had this wonderful teacher at school who was my English teacher, and she was white South African. And she brought words to my life and gave those words, life. So she brought in the subject of racism. And I had always known that I was treated differently in school, that the brown kids were treated differently to the white kids, that my mum and dad treated white people differently, almost more su with more superior superiority. And I didn't know that word before. And she also brought in sexism. And I didn't, I had encountered that my whole life, but I had never known that this is a whole philosophy, you know, where people are sexist. And so she gave me words which hadn't been part of my vocabulary. And I started to see that these things weren't just happening to me, they were happening to other people in the world. And they were wrong, that they were actually wrong. Um, and so at 13, I made the decision, I guess, having, and I don't think it was conscious that I wanted to change the world, but also that we mustn't treat people who are poor, who, who look different to us, who are dark skin, who are women differently. And actually, for me, that took me back to my Hindu philosophy, which is we're all the child of God. And we're all souls and we all beings. So, yeah, I guess I decided at a very young age that the only way I was going to be able to fight this sort of stuff was to be not in the community I was, where I was destined to be married. So the way I did that was study. 
And I studied to the point where um, I wanted to go to university, I did my GCSEs and my A-levels. And I, I was really lucky to have a deputy um, headmaster at school who championed for me with my parents. And he basically said, if you don't send your daughter to university, I'm going to send her to university. And I, I do wonder if the teachers like that still today, but I really hope they are. Because without this man, I don't know that I would have gone to university. And so I went to one of the best universities in the world. And I loved my time away. I grew up, I saw the world, I became a much more open to differences um, than I was before by just living in a different community. So I guess I saw injustice, I saw social injustice in my own life. And then when I saw it externally, it resonated with me because um, certainly I wasn't a victim of poverty, but I was a victim of oppression. I love how you put that, that you now all of a sudden had almost like a vocabulary for something you had experienced and now you could have the words to describe that. And I think that's also what looking at the, our season five theme of the sustainable development goals, that's what they intend to do as well with these 17 goals of putting words on our biggest challenges that we should be working towards. And you with the Subin Foundation are covering so many of those. Uh, I instantly was struck by the, uh, of course, there is goal number three, health, well-being, You are having running this this call line, right? With Mira, is that active? Yes, and in so many languages as well, where people can reach out if they are struggling with mental health and well being, or if they are in in situations where they feel unsafe. And I. I absolutely love that it is named after your late mom, Mira, right? Yeah. Tell us about that call line. My my mom died in 2016 and she, I spent a lot of my life not wanting to be like my mom um, because I saw her as someone who didn't want to kind of challenge the status quo. But in many ways, she did challenge the status quo. She was very active in the Indian community. She was, her love was the arts, and she brought um, Indian music and Indian dancing into the, the youth, and she nurtured that talent. Um, and she did a massive amount for fundraising for multiple initiatives in Hong Kong and, and in India. And she was the first woman in our community that certainly I know of, and I think it'd be fair to say in her generation, that really went out and served the community. Um, but she was also extraordinary in that she always managed to keep people happy which is something I don't know that I, I do at all. Um, I think I tend to ruffle feathers much more. But my mum died in 2016, and earlier that year she'd been diagnosed with um, a form of cancer called NPC, nasopharyngeal cancer. And I had the feeling she was dying, and so did my sister. And I don't mean for that to sound wishy-washy, But I think that is something certainly I feel I'm more tapped into now after Zubin's death. I, I kind of feel I'm a bit more sensitized to certain things. So I thought my mum was dying, and but I didn't think it was imminent. So she found out in June she had cancer and in August she passed away. Um, but when she 
was sick in July and I sat with her and I like I said I had this feeling I asked her mum what are the things that you still have left to do in terms of service to the community and she said I want to help women and girls who have it really hard they need somewhere to go and as a backstory my mum and I had helped together just my mum and me not with a foundation um in the years before we'd helped a couple of women who'd approached either me or my mum from our community who were victims of domestic violence um and in one case we managed to get that woman to be freed of her husband who had been burned um she would able to we helped her get hold of her child to the parents who her in-laws had kept kind of hostage and we got that child released and this woman was able to leave hong kong and go back to her parents in india um so my mum and i had worked on abuse together just as two women who felt strongly against it and so when my mum said to me you know i have something i still feel i have work to do for women in our community who are in crisis after she died it became really apparent to me that we needed to set up this helpline and my colleague Sandy Chan and I had been talking about helping female victims of domestic violence and women who were in just crisis for a long time but we had said no because we were worried about the backlash from men in the community who were working with us in in other areas but after my mum died i thought you know what i'm just going to do this and we'll deal with the wrath that comes with it And so we set up this helpline it runs 5 days a week from 10 to 4 and it operates in Hindi, Urdu and English. And the aim is really to be there for women. And so we're not a counseling center um in that particular case. Um where call Mira is call your friend. Call Mira, Mira is your friend. She's a woman, she loves you, she's not going to judge you. So call Mira about anything. So we get calls about in the last year I think 30% of our calls have been related to poverty and covid um 17% have been around legal issues um and there's a not an insignificant percentage and I don't have that particular percentage around uh, abuse at home so call mira has been really successful and this last year because I've been looking at writing our impact report for the last 12 months we had close to 900 calls and without without call mira i don't know what those people would have done because there is no other avenue which is in hindi and urdu and english for these women um so yes we look at the sdg around gender equality because you can never achieve any form of poverty alleviation unless you start addressing these very tricky and difficult questions and one of them is gender inequality. Mm. With SDG 5 it is one that's really close to our heart as well and I'm just grateful for do that for the work you do because as you say like these 900 conversations that were had they make an impact right and especially when you are communicating your impact i think it's often times really important to show these numbers but when you look in it qualitatively each and every one of these conversations they are healing right like just what we are doing now uh i've seen that so much for myself as well just having these conversations having someone there on the other side listening and actually caring for your suffering and pain and and absolutely i think you you hit it right on the you hit the nail on the head there i think we don't um we don't look at how lonely people are in the world there is a caller that's called us over i don't know 30 times and it's because she has no one else to talk to um and she calls just for that reason and she knows she calls for that reason i'm lonely i wanted to hear your voice today you know so there are people who are who are lost in their worlds and they have no one to talk to and sadly that many of the time that's women in in very vulnerable situations 
But, you know, SDG5 is linked in our case. So if we look at Call Mira as a platform is linked to um, hunger because we've had so many calls over the year about people being hungry, which is why we developed what you called, um, you know, our care box, which is something we never thought we'd do. Um, it's linked to poverty, which is SDG1. It's lin linked to the lack of quality education for these women, partly because they're denied it, like, you know, my life could have been. Um, and so, and even when they do work, you know, is it, it's linked to SDG8, is it decent work? Are they being paid properly? Are they being treated equally? Uh, which is again related to SDG 10, because um, there are so many equalities. And, you know, we work with the predominantly, um, the most vulnerable in our community, in the Hong Kong ethnic minority community, are the Hong Kong Pakistanis. And in that group, by far, it's the Hong Kong Pakistani women. And the racism, um, religious, uh, racist, um, discrimination towards these women exists. And so how do you reduce those sorts of inequalities? How do you change mindsets when women um, who wear the, the hijab are discriminated against when they walk into a job interview, even getting to the interview on the MTR or on the bus? So I feel with, for example, just SDG5, it's linked to so many other SDGs and in the diversity and inclusion world, we call that intersectionality. But it's exactly the same with the SDGs. There's intersectionality and often, you know, one's linked to so many other SDGs. In my conversations with all these amazing change makers I had in the past five years, we're going on five years of Hashtag Impact Podcast. Can you believe it? <laughs> I I can't. <laughs> and I I feel so I feel so privileged because I get to I get to get on the calendar with all these people that are really walking the talk and making an impact like yourself and I I I really want now as it's going on to these 5 years I challenged myself to look at it in a bigger picture because Our listeners, I know when you're listening right now, you are probably trying to find your own ways of making an impact, trying to find inspiration here from, from our amazing guests. And what I challenged myself to do is to look into what, what is that moment? You know, you shared those moments as a 13 year old that made you realize that there is so much injustice. But what are other things that are defining us in a way that helps us to actually keep going with our mission and vision of making that world a better place? And you know what I've discovered? Oftentimes, I think it's pain. It's something that is happening to us something that defined us in a way that we are ourselves suffering and we want to reduce that suffering for others. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. How do you look and cope with pain? Oh, I don't know that I'm the best example here. Um, When Zubin died in 2009, I died. I died multiple times, and I don't know how that's even possible. But watching your child suffer, a child suffer, and I can only talk about me, was impossible. The shock to the system of watching your child being resuscitated is something that no one should ever have to confront 
and the helplessness that I felt. You know, I still feel because I didn't save him. I couldn't save him. I didn't save him. Sometimes it's the same thing. And the shock to the system of watching that and having it permeate into your fiber. It, the pain is not in one place. It's in every cell. And I feel it still. And I think I wouldn't be around today. I know I wouldn't be around today if the love I felt for my daughter, who was 18 months at the time, if she, if she wasn't around, if she hadn't been born. Because pain and love, I've come to realize, are the are opposite sides of the same coin. You only hurt so much when you love so much. And... And so, does my, does my suffering drive me? I think in the case of the Zubin Foundation, in the case of Zubin's death, I don't know that I would have done anything more with my life after community business. When Zubin died, I stepped down from that organization that I founded, and I just couldn't breathe. And I just wanted to be with my daughter. And that's all I wanted. And many years later, five years later, a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, he had set up a trust called the Zubin Mitani Gudamal Foundation. And he was leaving the company that managed the trust. And he said, you're going to have to turn this into a charity now because we, when Zubin passed away, people donated to that. And so there was this money that I had to use because we said, he had said in the obituary that, you know, please make checks out payable, you know, if you want to um, make a donation to this trust that he'd set up. So I almost think that he had planned for this time for me. And so I had this vehicle that I had to drive. And then when I thought about how much, I don't know, am I allowed to swear on this? Absolutely. Um, how much shit there is that happens to people in my community who are poor, who are discriminated against, who have no voice. I thought, you know, my, my beginnings were so similar to some of these women in that, you know, I came from financial privilege, but my education wasn't meant to go higher than the age of 16, possibly 18. I was supposed to marry someone at the age of 18. You know, I was supposed to not study any further. I was supposed not to be an argumentative woman. And I broke those barriers because people helped me along the way and I need to help others. But I didn't do that when people say, oh, that's so nice of you. And I say, no, you don't get it. I would give it all up if I could have Zubin back. You know, I'm not this great martyr. I did it because circumstances led me to this with this trust and then I had to do something with the mother money because people gave it to us. And, and then I wanted to look at an issue that was so hard that no one touched in Hong Kong. And given that I'm a brown woman and I understand a lot of this community, I decided to champion for them. Yes, my suffering has helped me channel some of that anger into something good for others. But I would, I would, in a heartbeat, and it sounds terrible, but last year we impacted the lives of over 15,000 people. If I could undo that and have my child back, I would. 
But you know what? Nobody asked if they could take my child away. I didn't have a choice. And so I have to play the cards that have been given to me, and these are the cards. Um, but certainly from the anti-discrimination perspective, that is something that I do use my pain, I suppose, to channel for the better, betterment of others. And I use it in many communities. I use it to our ethnic minority community to say, would it be so bad if your daughter was educated like me? Am I so bad? And then I also use it when people stereotype ethnic minority women. And I say, really? Am I like that? So I use the pain in different ways, I suppose. He would be 15 going on 16. If this would be a moment, what would you say to him today? I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know that I can go there emotionally. I don't think I have the strength to go there. Mm. But I do find it extraordinarily difficult still to look at boys who are that age. Mm. I find it hard. I find myself thinking and, um, you know, it does, I find myself wondering because I lost him at three. He wasn't given that chance. We weren't given that chance. Um, I don't know what I would say to him. But I tell you what, I would do anything to have him back for a moment. Um, but yeah, we spend our lives negotiating with God. Um, as a mother of a, a lost child, you, you do a lot of negotiating. <laughs> To no avail, by the way. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that for the rest of my days, because I should have died and he should have lived, the rest of my days I have to help people who are suffering. And I don't even know that that makes sense to somebody listening. But kind of that's the way I feel. He, he paid the price when I should have paid the price because a mother dies before a child it doesn't happen the other way it defeats nature but he went first and so I better make this life worthwhile the way to make it worthwhile is to um, look in the eyes of other people who are suffering and help them so they don't feel helpless, like certainly I did when he was dying. And I couldn't save him. But, you know, maybe all the people that I can help, it's, it's a little bit of a step in the right direction for them. But it's, yeah, I don't... I don't even know that I expect people to understand that. Because how can you? And and I don't want you to, actually. Don't go there. It's, it's, it's dark beyond dark. Don't go there. Um, so I almost don't want people to understand. I want them to see me as the woman who lost the child. Gosh, that's awful. Gosh, I'm glad I'm not there. But I don't know that I want them to understand. I'm trying to find the words. Do you notice? <laughs> <laughs> there are there uh, are no words and you know I I also know that's okay. And for people who 
your listeners have heard who if if anyone who's listening knows someone who's lost a child for me certainly one of the things that means so much to me even now in Subin died in 2009 is when when someone says i'm really sorry for the loss of your child because it's about acknowledging that he lived and he lives he lives in that word that you said i'm sorry that you lost him and um acknowledge that child because i can tell you that for the mother it is huge it is monumental and she walks with that child still which is why when people ask me the hardest question you can ask me the hardest question is how many children do you have because for most people it's simple but for me i have three but if i'm paying at the supermarket and i have one of my children with me and the cashier asks me how many do you have i don't want it to get i don't want to get into a discussion about my dead child and i don't want to ig- ignore and delete him because that's not the way i feel and it's just not the way it is it's not the truth he is still my child he doesn't live with me but for as long as i live he lives in me and so i have three children and so the way i explain it to my children always have is i have three children mummy will always have three children one lives with god and both of you live with me um so it's kind of hard to get into that conversation with someone um you know is at the supermarket or you're on a reception and someone asks you this and you just want to have a very light conversation but mostly i say three and then it is awkward but it's kind of just the way it is so you not being able to find the words that's okay because let's never normalize losing a, a dead losing a child it's good that it's awkward it's good that it's awkward and it's it's good that the impact you are making on these people that are now helped with your work with the Subin Foundation have this place now as well that you have created for them and the conversations you are continuing to have and the systemic change that you are driving and we didn't even we didn't even get to the to the details of all of that amazing work you are doing and keep doing uh because we always you know looking at the times and not having you know i would love to have just another another five hours to just hear <laughs> all about that um but you know what i would love the listeners to do is to discover it for themselves as they are going to your channels looking into the programs you're running connecting with you on on LinkedIn and the places where you are active so that they can learn more about the Subin Foundation and how they can become involved as well and can support should we do that Shalini absolutely so um i'd be you know delighted if if your listeners would check out the zubin foundation simple www.zubinfoundation.org also march 21st is the international day for the elimination of race discrimination and i would urge you wherever you live in the world to acknowledge the divide that exists because of race it's um a nonsensical divide and i hope you will pause and um and try and understand it and if you're interested in looking at the work we're doing in hong kong to 
to mark this day on March 21st, please follow us on uh, the Zubin Foundation Facebook, which is exactly that, the Zubin Foundation. And you can follow me too on LinkedIn, Shalini Matani. Um, thank you so much today, Regina. I won't let you go until you go through the quick fire round with me. Sure. You ready? Sure. Making an impact means improving someone's life. Someone who has inspired you in the way they tackle the sustainable development goals. Christine Lowe. And what could everyone do right now to make the world a better place? Everyone. Oh, that's a tough one. What could everyone do to make the world a better place? I have a motto um, that my team know, which is we help because we can. Anyone listening to this podcast can help. They have a device and they're listening on this device to me speak. Do anything. Give a dollar to charity. Give a million dollars to charity. When you next see a homeless person, say hello. Look up the closest organization, you know, in your, in your district that supports the environment. See if you can volunteer. Just limit your showers to three minutes. You know, adopt a child. Not, I mean, not, literally, you can if you want, foster a child. Support an organization that sponsors children and gives scholarships to girls. Everyone on this who's listening to this podcast can make a difference. There is no excuse. And when people say, oh, but that's just such a small bit, I say, well, how do you think we all started? So when I started so long ago in 2022, and I knocked on doors, on doors to different NGOs and asked them if they needed my help, and they basically said no, because I was an English speaker. I decided to set up my, my, my first NGO, and that was in 2002. And so, you know, every little bit makes a difference. And so whatever it is, giving a dollar, you know, advocating for a cause, just listening to Regina's podcasts, and then sharing it, just do your little bit, because you can. It's as simple as that. Do your bit because you can. And if we all just did that little bit, the world would be so much better than it is today. Do your bit because you can. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I you, appreciate you taking the time and you sharing from your heart. It means everything and there is one thing that I would love to quote actually I usually I don't do that I'm totally totally going over my own script here today but it's just it's been so inspiring and I think it wraps it up beautifully as well um that you shared in dear Hong Kong I have you here with me oh wow <laughs> ah, the beautiful dear Hong Kong publication uh, I think I would like to read this. Wait, let me make this happen. Um, where you were interviewed as one of the amazing people making Hong Kong so special, right? Uh, where you say, people born into privilege take many things for granted. I think about how my circumstances would have been different had I been born into a disadvantaged family. If I had been born in that situation, I would hope that there would be champions in the community who would try and help me. I co-created a foundation that works with the most marginalized ethnic minorities to improve their lives and reduce suffering. 
I'm a fundamental believer in diversity, inclusion, and trying to influence systemic and positive change. And oh, you are, Shalini, you are. So thank you for that. Thank you for being that champion, you know, for making that change, for doing that thing because you can. And it's such an inspiration for, for, for us and our community here at Hashtag Impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to start your own podcast, get your voice out there in the world, I want to help you. You can head over to hashtag impact.com slash free to access the first chapter of my podcasting course. Without any strings attached, it will give you the foundation to get your podcast going, to put your vision in writing and to show you all the tools you need to have a really, really great start. For every sold course, we also give free access to the full course to our NGO fellows. We are currently working with the most amazing NGOs. One of them is focusing on anti-bullying in schools for young children and many, many more. So it is truly making an impact if you decide to start your own podcast. So have a think. And just reach out. You have, if you have any question at all, find me at Regina at hashtag impact dot com to learn more about how we support you and the community to get their voice and their stories out there in the world. Talk to you soon. Bye.